Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show, Arise, Sir Steve Hansen. Welcome to the show, Steve. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Yeah, good day, Lehman. Thanks for having us on board. Well, you are very welcome, and we're very grateful that you're able to give up your time to come on the show. And, and I think, given the current circumstances in the world, there probably wouldn't be any other scenario where you would be available if you weren't in a lockdown. Does that sound a bit uh, right? Yeah, well, life has slowed down a wee bit. Um, I've only got uh, a bit of work up in Japan with Toyota, Ver Blitz, uh, rugby club, and um, a bit of other consultancy work I'm doing. So not too busy. So yeah, I've got time to help you out. So, and uh, Wanaka's quite cold at the moment, so I don't really want to be going outside either. Well, I checked the temperature for Wanaka this morning and the official reading was colder than a mother-in-law's kiss was the, uh, the official reading. <laughs> yeah, well, you've obviously got the wrong mother-in-law. <laughs> She's actually a really great woman. Uh, we're not married yet, but uh, you couldn't ask for a better mother-in-law, so I won't include her. But yeah, um... <laughs> uh, Steve, I'd like to start off with a curly one if I could. Mm. You, uh, you worked as a police officer for a few years before you went yeah. coaching full-time. Yeah. Have you ever arrested anyone that you later ended up coaching? Uh, no, but I did. Uh, I was coaching somebody that I did remove um, from a, uh, an event that uh, he didn't need to be anywhere near. So, um, yeah. But, look, I, I think... The way I approach uh, policing was that uh, young people are going to make mistakes and, um, you know, don't, uh, don't jump in at the deep end, just work your way through the process and, um, you know, if it warrants them being arrested, then I guess you have to, but uh, first and foremost, give them an opportunity to learn from the mistake they've made. Wasn't always uh, seen by the hierarchy as the way to go, but, um, you know, sometimes you just got to make your own decisions, don't you? Well, I remember avoiding... I mean, I did have a drink driving conviction when I was 17 after hitting a parked car, taking a carload full of mates to KFC that turns out later was actually shut at the time. And thankfully, no one was injured, uh, not badly at least, and, and I learnt my lesson. But my experience with the police growing up in Christchurch was really pretty good. And I think that police 10-7 seem to be quite indicative of my experience there, although there was a group called the party busters back in the mid 1990s, uh, late 1990s sort of era that would go around and break up house parties. And they were, there was a big army. Of that. Did you ever have any dealings with any of those particular police? No, I was out of the police by then. I finished in 96. So I was full time coaching in 96. So I was well and truly gone by the late nineties. So no dealings with them. But. Well, I'm glad my police days are behind me, but uh, obviously fond memories for you, Stephen. And you grew up in Mosgiel near Dunedin. Yeah. What, what was home life for you like back in your early days? Uh, pretty good. We, we um, initially lived on the main street of Mosgiel and then uh, mum and dad bought a dairy farm out on the Torrey Plains out by the Dunedin airport <coughs> and at the bottom of the Mangatua Hills. And uh, we... She moved out there when I was about seven and stayed there until I was about 15 or 16. Mum and Dad sold the farm and went and bought a pub in Crosshurst. So uh, we, we had a great time, you know. You um, worked on the farm and got a work ethic, I suppose, which uh, was handy. Got to spend lots of time uh, with my father and, and um, you know, play sport and just had a normal country kid's life. And, you know, you grow up a lot quicker. You know, we were driving cars and everything by the time we were... 11 or uh, 12 because you're driving the tractors and um, so yeah that was good good time and certainly um, yeah, can't blame uh, my upbringing on any faults I've got. Well what faults would they be? You seem like the the perfect man on the surface of things. Is there anything that... No, there's, no, there's no such thing as a perfect man so um, but you know like like all of us you make mistakes and uh, along the way and it's about learning from those and, and trying to be the best you can be and uh, I don't think you can beat yourself up over them um, 
you know, because if you're spending so much time beating yourself up over them, you, you, you're not actually moving forward. And it's important as human beings that we move forward. I think um, yeah, one of the greatest things that I've learned over time is that your identity is not built around one thing. Um, you know, as an example, think of a wooden bridge and it's got many planks and, and you as a person, you know, you've got many planks, like you're a father, you're a, a son, you're a brother, uh, you're a rugby coach. And, um, you know, not, don't, don't allow yourself as a young person to be identified just with one of those identities. And I think that's one of our problems as young people, we, we get caught just with one of those identities. You know, maybe it's, you know, I'm a rugby player and, and then all of a sudden we fail at that and uh, we can't cope with it and uh, it takes us in a direction that, you know, we don't need to go with. So, you know, if you understand that there's you as a human being is made up of many things and and how much and how you want to live um, in those areas is, is widely important. But understanding it's not just one thing that makes up Laban or one thing that makes up Steve Hansen. Well, and just on that, I mean, you've spoken very fondly about the influence that your father had on you and the values that he instilled in you when you were younger. What were some of those? Well, he, he, he left school when he was 13, um, not because he, he wasn't um, bright enough, but because he had to. Uh, so, you know, and a lot of people, his generation were like that. Um, but he installed, you know, the, the worth of honesty and, and hard work um, and, and you know, you got nothing for, for nothing. You had to work for it. Um, and, and when you did get it, uh, you didn't have to tell the world about it. Just keep, stay humble, keep your feet on the floor. And, um, you know, those things have been stood by me, you know, all my life. And, you know, you mentioned not being perfect. And we know, you know, we know no one is. I mean, was there any points when you were, particularly when you were younger, maybe in your teens, that you were maybe on a path that had you not been pulled aside by someone, a mentor or someone influential where you could have maybe gone off the rails or not reached your full potential? Uh, no, I was pretty lucky. Look, we, we lived away and Mosgiel was a little place and, and um, we, we, uh, we lived about eight and a half miles away from that. So I didn't get to catch up with everybody every day. Um, it was only, and we went to school on a bus, so get on the bus, come home, uh, get on the bus, go to school sort of thing. But, and I think it's the people you mix with that can take you off track. And, and um, you know, especially if, if you're a little vulnerable because things aren't great at home or uh, in your life. And, you know, things are really great for me. So uh, in, in, at home and in my life, um, sport was really important. Played a lot of sport and that kept me busy. And it's, it's just, I think, when you're a young kid, uh, and you don't have a lot of time. Uh, if you have too much time on your hands, sorry, that's when you can get yourself into mischief because you're you're looking to fill that void. And um, you know, I was lucky enough not to have a void, so I, I escaped uh, most things. Do you think that gratitude that you that you're able to to call upon now has been something that's been a part of Steve Hansen for all of his life? I think so. I think you know you don't forget. Um, probably don't appreciate it how good it was until you get a bit older um, you know and and you're too busy you know doing your own thing you know once you become a teenager your parents don't know anything but then you find out they did but you you get to a stage in your life I guess when you start to look back and reflect on things and um, you know you, you do appreciate the, the start you got and you know, like mum and dad went out of their way to do everything for us kids. And, and did we appreciate it enough at the time? Probably not. But um, as time went on, we did. Uh, I was lucky enough um, under, you know, tragic cir uh, circumstances to have dad live with us once mum died. So, you know, I had uh, a lot of time with him later in his life. And, and I was old enough and um, maybe wise enough to understand you know, that that was quality time and, um, you know, enjoyed every minute. I was lucky enough that my wife uh, embraced it as well. So, you know, really thankful for it. If you could, I mean, I don't know whether you talk to your mum still, but if there's something, if, if she could come back for five minutes, what would be the, and you had one thing that you could say to her, what would that be? 
Oh, I'd give up smoking because that's what killed her. Um, she was a big smoker. But uh, no, look, you just give her a hug and say, look, I love your mum and thanks. Mm. Yeah, it's one of those really... I mean, th thankfully, I've both got both of my parents alive. One, one by the skin of his teeth based on, you know, a lifetime of sedentary uh, and, and, and smoking his backside off as well, sitting on a radio announcer's chair for 40 years. But yeah. thankfully, I've got him. And I, and I do really appreciate the time that I have with them both. I think maybe it is an age thing, Steve, where you just, as you get older, you're just like, you know what, these people aren't quite so bad. And they're, they're doing the best they can with the tools they, they have available. And, you know, like they grew up in, in an environment where they didn't have access to, you know, research and learn about all the stuff that can make us, uh, you know, better individuals. But I think that's the key thing. Like you, you, you become to understand that, you know, as a child, you think they've got no faults and then you get old enough to realize actually they do. And, and you, we probably judge them because of that. And then we get old enough to overcome that and understand, well, actually they're just doing the best they can. And, and with the tools they've got. And, and if you're lucky enough to have parents that have got enough tools, then life's pretty easy. If you're unlucky and, and, and your parents don't have the tools and don't have the ability to, to get help, uh, then you know things are a lot tougher. And um, it doesn't mean to say that you have to be like that. And I think that's where we, we have a choice. And sometimes it's a really difficult choice, but it is a choice to, to am I going to continue to be like my parents? Uh, and, and if they're positive influence, well, yeah, that's pretty easy. But if they're not, then you, you still have a choice to be able to be different with your own children if you're lucky enough to have them. And um, you know, you've got to try and break that cycle. And I think, I think we're seeing more and more of it um, because we're better educated around parenting. And, you know, I've always been amazed that they spend all this time teaching you about the arrival of the baby and then they don't teach you anything about what to do after it happens. They just give you the baby and say, see you later. And that's, you know, it's, it's a tough time, especially when you have your new first one. Well, this is something that's very close to my heart, Steve, because I'm actually, I've nearly completed my very first book and the, the book was inspired by a conversation I had with a motivational speaker, Les Brown, who came on the show. I don't know if you know Les. Um, sort of largely regarded as one of the great motivational speakers of our time. And he encouraged me to think about the attributes that I was able to get from, especially my mum and dad, at, at about the age of five or six. And despite the many flaws that all parents have, when I started focusing on these really wonderful gifts that I was able to get from mum and dad, and you know, people in my life, uh, it really it reframed my appreciation for them, and it's become the cornerstone of the content of the book. And and I think, you know, it's really easy to forget that these people shape our lives in in every way, shape, or form. It's, and like you say, it's up up to us to pick the the parts that we think are valuable and will will assist us going forward. You yeah, know, I think you know when you're doing that, those parts might change too as you go through different stages in your own life. And um, you'll undervalue some and you overvalue others. But the important thing is, you know, it, it's about you, you as the person. And and as I said, we've got choices. We, we, we can, as long as we give ourselves the ammunition to go where we want to go, then you know, there's not too many things that should stop us. There's a quote, I don't know who said it, Steve, but it was along the lines of you're never too old to learn and you're never too young to teach. And the reason I bring this up is with regards to Richie McCaw, who you've spoken about many times being the greatest you've ever seen, but not technically the best. What is it about Richie McCaw that was just so amazing in your opinion? Well, I think that attribute was an amazing thing, you know, and an athlete who's, who's talented, and I've, I've been quoted as saying he didn't have any talent, but he obviously he has talent. But, <laughs> yeah. But, but not a, like, he's not a guy that was an X Factor person, player. He's an X Factor person because he had other attributes that were off the chart. Like, his mental toughness was unbelievable. Many times he showed that, you know, no more so in the World Cup in 2011 when he played, played you know, a lot of it with a broken bone in his foot. But his ability to, 
to recognise that he could get better if he chose to want to was the thing that I admired most. And he would frequently come and see me at the start of a campaign and I was lucky enough to coach him at all three levels, Canterbury, uh, Super Rugby and then at, at international level. And every campaign he would come and ask, okay, what can I get better at this this campaign? And we would set it, you know, him a task and away he'd go and he'd just work away at it, work away at it. Had the, the patience to be able to understand that, okay, I'm not too good at it just yet, but I can get good at it if I keep doing this. And um, he, he would, you know, and in the end, he was the complete rugby player. Like uh, he's not a tall man, but he he'd, he'd win you a line at ball that was vital at a vital stage in the game. Um, he was always good over the ball in the ruck, so he continued to be good at that. And he worked on his strengths as well as his weaknesses. But you know, he was aware that he had weaknesses, and he wanted to keep trying to get them better. And you know, it takes a lot to do that when you're the best in the world. You could sit back and you know bask in that glory, or you can do what he did and said, well, I want to be even better. You know, I'm not the finished article. Um, uh, he, he's a very good man. He seems to be like the epitome of humility. I mean, I don't know the guy personally, but uh, that, that message just keeps coming from, from everyone that talks about him. And uh, uh, here's a curly one for you as well, Steve. If you were, if you were coached, if you swapped the ages around, if you were coached by Richie McCaw, when you were growing up playing rugby, do you think you would have, been given enough insight to be able to, and mental toughness to get to that all black level that you, that you were so desperate to get to? Uh, well, you've got to have some talent. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the problem. Um, <laughs> you know, you wanted to be an all black and I didn't have enough of it. So, you know, and, and once you uh, realize that you actually come to peace with yourself for not having made it, like I was okay. But you know, to be an All Black, you have to be you have to be one of the best players, and and I wasn't that, so that's okay. You know, I, I come to um, to understand that, and and um, did I still want to be an All Black? Of course I did. You know, like it's uh, for a lot of um, kids, that's that's their dream, but only a very few can make it, and that's what makes it so uh, so wonderful when you do but also makes it something you want to do because if everyone could do it then it wouldn't be so exciting would it no not at all and i uh it reminds me of uh, playing rugby at christchurch boys high which, which i know you spent a few years at mm. i played outside uh scott hamilton in the third 15 right and who then went on to become an all black played about Two or th one or two tests, three tests maybe. Bubble, big shout out to you, Bubble. And uh, and I and I just remember um, maybe a few years ago, just thinking, wow, you know, his work ethic must have just been through the roof in order to get that good because it was very competitive. We had uh, blokes like Aaron Major uh, in the side at that point, um, very talented school, uh, and yeah, just a great effort by him. And I remember a few people saying, you know. Uh, how did he get a gig? Like you, you earn your spot in that team, and he did that. Yeah, well, that's right. And and like a lot of people forget that schoolboy rugby uh, has a lot to do with. I think anyway, when you're born, if you're born between January and August, you you, you develop a lot earlier. Particularly if you're January, February, March, April, um, you develop a lot quicker than the kids that are born. October, September, November, December, you know, and, and at that age in your life, that, that's a massive, there's a massive gap physically and, and uh, you know, to some people just take a little bit longer and, you know, Bubble might have been one of those guys that just took a little bit longer um, to find his feet, but when he did, he, he certainly played well and he deserved his opportunity. So, he's gone on to have a great professional career and, um, you know, I'd say he's thoroughly enjoyed himself. He's not a bloke that... Would ever die wondering, that's for sure. Well, I think it's it's phenomenal and it's great inspiration for anyone listening to this or watching this. You know, like anything's possible. And uh, you know, that that piece that you you got to when you finally realized that, you know, your shot at the All Blacks was was no longer, but 
you know, the blessing in turn for the rest of the, the country and the world really was that Steve Hansen went on and, be, and became this extraordinary coach. I'm very philosophical and I'm very spiritual. And I think that a lot of these things are deliberate in, in terms of they are there to happen for a reason. And the sacrifice that you've personally made was, was the, to the benefit of the rest of the world. So for that, we're very, very grateful. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, I think you, you know, I don't know if it's, um, it's luck or whatever, but you, you, your experiences shape you. There's no doubt about that. And good experience has shaped you just as much as bad ones. And people often say to me, oh, you know, you, you, you must have been lucky to have been coached by some great coaches. And I, I would say every time to that, yes, I was. I was very lucky. I had... You know, a father who was a great coach. I had you know, people like Alex Wiley, a uh, great coach. Um, Gordy Hunter, great coach. Uh, Andy Holland, great coach. You know, I could go on and on and on and on about all these great coaches. But I also had some really poor ones. And I learned as much off the poor ones um, as well because they teach you what not to do. And as a rugby player, I was sort of in and out of teams all the time. I, you know, I wanted to be in the Canterbury team, but I'd be, and back in those days, I only had squads of 21. And I'd always seem to be the 22nd or the 23rd person. So I was on the fringe, get a bit of a go. And then, and then um, because I wanted it so much, I wouldn't take advantage of the go I got as well as I probably should have, uh, particularly early on. And then uh, you're back out again. And, and being one of those people taught me how to be treat, how to treat young players when I was coaching them who were in the same situation and maybe help them um, overcome the fact that, okay, well, you're on the fringe, but at the moment you're not quite good enough. But if you keep doing blah, 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 then you, you might be. And, and it certainly taught me the value of empathy towards those people um, and honesty. Like you've got to be honest with them. And sometimes, you know, I got told things that that just weren't honest. And, you know, you go away thinking, right, oh, well, I'll do that, but you do it. And still you don't get, you know, and um, as I say, so you learn things off, off bad experiences just as much as you do good ones. And uh, if you're flexible enough, you talked about it earlier, you know, being able to be agile enough with your thinking. Uh, and we often talk about flexible thinking. So, you know, you, you keep your mind open to to change and because change is something we don't like uh, because we don't understand what's going to happen if it does happen and it can affect us negatively or, or um, but, but change is often, if it's the right change, it's, it's good for us. Um, you know, and be prepared to, to discuss it anyway, if nothing else. Well, what are some of the, the gold nuggets from a, not even going to say coaching because it's really leadership that you're doing. What, what are some of the, the really great ideas that you can share with our audience and me today? Um, I think, look, if, if you're going to lead people, then you first thing you've got to be able to understand is what kind of leader do I want to be? You know, sort your own backyard out first. So take some time, not just to charge into the office and say, right, oh, well, I'm the boss, this is the way it's going to be. Actually, take some time and say, right, oh, well, do I want to empower people? Do I want to be a dictator? And and I think there's a, if everybody's got their own opinion on which one works the best. But I always have and always will when I'm trying to lead people is think about my family. And my two-year-old, I can't empower because they don't have the skill set to be able to do it. Um, so I've got to give some direction and some dictatorship to that two-year-old. But as that two-year-old turns into a five-year-old, I, I, I can give them a little bit more rope or her a little bit more rope. As they turn into a teenager, I'm giving them more and more of their own responsibility. And, and eventually, you know, you work out, well, now they're 18, 19, they're, they're, they're adults. They're allowed to vote. They're allowed to go and serve their country and get shot and killed. So who am I to tell them what to do? Yeah. And so I'm the same in the rugby team. When they first come in, then, okay, there'll be a little bit of directional 
uh, conversation, but first and foremost is you've got to learn to lead yourself. And when I can see they can do that, then then you give them more and more power. And it's the same in any business, I think. You know, you you employ people to do a job, let them do the job. And if they stuff up, then you teach them how not to stuff up. Uh, but but first and foremost, understand that they're they're doing something that can make you better. Because if they really do their job really well and, and, and you allow them to bring things to the table that you might not have thought of, because I, I don't know anything about rugby, then then we can get an idea that might be great for the company, great for the team. It doesn't matter where the idea comes from. So making sure, uh, A, I think that you're flexible, B, you understand what kind of leader you want to be. And then the third key thing, I think, uh, is mastering your ego. Anyone that says they don't have an ego is talking crap. Every living human being has one. And, and it comes from wanting to be valued. You know, uh, we, we need to know that we're valued. Makes us feel good. And when we do something really good, that, that feeds that, that value. And, and um, sometimes we allow that to let our ego get ahead of us. So we've all got one. So the key is actually mastering it, not letting it get away on you. And that's something that can you can have control of it one minute and then you know you let it slip uh, and that can do quite a bit of damage so okay master my own ego which means if someone comes in here and says steve um i i don't you know can you tell me about this i don't have to have the answer you know if, I, if i'm honest and vulnerable enough to say to them, look Laban, i don't know the answer to that but i'll tell you what we'll do we'll find out I'll go and find someone that does. And that's your job as a leader. You know, it's not, your job is not to know everything. Your job is to be able to resource and find the solution for someone else's problem. Because, and when you understand that, I think it makes life a lot easier. You know, you don't feel like you have to be right all the time. And, and that can be challenging too. And the other thing, I guess you've got to make sure that your pride doesn't get in the way. You know, like in all your competitiveness. Like I'm really, really competitive. So I've got to be careful all the time to check that, that it's not, you know, e even with with the family, if we're playing games, you know, I can make it a little awkward because I get quite a, a competitive. <laughs> so I've got to understand that because otherwise it turns some people off. And um, it took me, you know, probably that was uh, well into my 30s till I understood that. You know, because I always wanted to win. Didn't matter if it was a conversation, a game of marbles, whatever. You know, if there's a bit of banter, I always wanted to have the last word. So, you know, you've got to be aware of all those things. And um, and then one, once you have that framework, then you can go out and say, right, what kind of people do I need to be able to work for me? You know, and, and uh, my first uh, interview for the All Blacks, I went with an understanding of, right, here's my strengths and weaknesses. Here's the strengths and weaknesses of the people we've just lost. So Graham Henry and Wayne Smith both uh, were departing. So I've got to replace those because we had a, you know, the, the, the combination of the three of us was working really well. So it would be foolish not to, to make sure we had those skills replaced. And then what else could we add in that we didn't have? And you know, the inconvenient facts about things are that uh, using us as the All Blacks, okay, we're one of the best teams in the world. At the time, we were the number one team in the world. We just won the uh, World Cup. Um, the inconvenient fact, though, was if we went through every team we played against, they did some things better than us. We did some things better than them, and then there were some things that we did the same. So who was going to help us with the stuff that we weren't as good as them at? So you, you, you do your homework, you find the people, and sometimes those people aren't, you know, the, the so-called flyers. They're not the people everyone thinks they are because I find that perception creates um, our, our judgment of people. So, okay, and using myself as an example, okay, well, Steve's won a lot of things and the All Blacks been really successful. So the perception would be he's a great coach. Well, I, I could be a useless coach, but just be lucky enough to have um, 
a lot of people that have made me look successful. When you get in there and you understand and see the reality, what 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 makes uh, change? You know, what what what's real is the character of the people, and it's your character, the person you look at when you have a shave in the morning if you're a bloke, or or the woman you look at when you you know you brush your hair and clean your teeth if you're a lady. That that person that's looking back at you, they know all your flaws, and and the strength of that person. Uh, when you need them to be strong is important. And that's reality. I love that, Steve. That's really great. And I, um, I'd, I'd love for you to share just on the on that topic your favourite rugby memory, whether it be playing, coaching, just watching your favourite rugby memory if you have one. Uh, well, people often ask me. You know what is it I like? You know about coaching, and and I've already said I'm really competitive, so winning, you know, is, is something. But the thing I love most, and the reason I started coaching, was I wanted to help other people achieve their dreams. And um, you know, I, I I was lucky again in that I had a, a a coach who was my father, who made me think about the game, and and try and understand the game. So. Um, it was always going to be natural that I did some form of rugby coaching. Whether I was going to be any good at it or not, I didn't know. But what I wanted to be able to do was to go and help little Johnny uh, achieve something that he thought he'd like to do, but didn't know if he could do it or didn't know how to do it. And that always brought me the most satisfaction. When you saw a player achieve something that you knew that you played a small part in him achieving it and seeing the joy that they got out of it. Like, and unless you were involved, you probably wouldn't understand the, or see the joy, but at, because you were involved, you could see the delight that they would have in doing that. And um, I think that, that for me was, you know, and there was many occasions like that. Um, you know, we had a, I was lucky enough to be involved with a young player called Andrew Mertens. Um, Shout out, Mertz. Was, <laughs> yeah, a very young player. He It was his first year as uh, in the seniors, and I selected him. And um, it was my first year as a coach. So he was first year as a player and my first year as a coach. And anyway, uh, at the end of that year, he said, oh, look, I, I wouldn't mind. Uh, I've got an, an opportunity to go and play in uh, Italy. And I said, well, Mertz, you're not a very big man and you probably need to do a bit of work in the gym. So if you get yourself a decent program and you know, hook into the gym, uh, then you can go. So away he goes. And I, I get this letter from him um, telling me about what he's been up to. And, you know, and then he signs it off as uh, Andrew Arnold uh, Mertz. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew straight away then that he would have been doing nothing in the gym. <laughs> the, he he arrived back and uh, he I don't know if you know him much, but he's he's a very effervescent young man and and a good bloke. But he arrives back and season started and he slots back in and he he has a horror of a game. And uh, after the Afterwards, we always, back in those days, you go back to club rooms and we'd have an hour together just as a team with the partners. And any, anyway, at the end of that hour, I said, oh, Mitch, you, you can stay and help me clean up. And uh, so we were putting jugs into the trays and, you know, the tray would go straight in the dishwasher. Well, he'd leave the jugs up the wrong way. <laughs> he said, I said, dip them up the other way. He said, what for? I said, because they go on the dishwasher. And he goes, oh, well, that's what they employ those other people for. I said, why don't you just go back inside? Anyway, he knew I was pissed off with him and he, he went across one side of the room and I was on the other side and he was looking at me and I, well, I wouldn't pay him any attention. And he, anyway, eventually he came over and said, right, let's pop outside. And um, we'd, we'd lost the game by a couple of points and he'd, he'd, his goal kicking had been terrible. And he said, oh, you're just grumpy with me because of my goal kicking. I said, no, I'm not. He said, I don't care about your goal kicking. Because I'm grumpy with you because you didn't pay any respect at all to what we talked about, uh, how to play the game. And you, and you made your forwards have to work too hard 
to, and you didn't care stuff about them. It was all about you. I said, just like it was when you were putting the jugs in, in the, in the thing. I said, you didn't give her stuff because it was someone else was going to do that. I said, you're never going to make it as a rugby player, mate, until you start looking after the people in front of you. And anyway, he got it. And he went on to become a great rugby player. And, and he, he became a great rugby player because he got that point. And, you know, like you take a lot of pleasure out of that, knowing that, okay, well, he heard me and he's gone and done something about it. He, he did it. I didn't do it. I just had to give him the direction. Um, but seeing someone like that be successful was good. You know, and you know, obviously winning World Cups and all that are, are great and, and, um, and important because you're giving a lot of other people pleasure too. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I don't know Mertens uh, personally, but I've got, I must have watched almost all the games with the Crusaders in the early days down at uh, Lancaster Park or Jade Stadium, whatever it's called these days. Yeah, oh, it's gone now. They actually bulldoze it over after the earthquake, so. Yeah, are they, they going to build anything back there or is the ground all ruined? No, I think they're going to build um, in town somewhere, but, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things they're going to do. I don't think they'll, they'll ever get around to doing it because it costs too much money. Well, I think it'll be a cool city in um, maybe 10 or 15 years, hopefully sooner. Yeah, but it'll, be, it'll be awesome. Yeah. yeah. Your achievements in the game, Steve, are second to none. But would you say your proudest achievements would be your children? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I think so. Um, but their achievements are theirs. They're not mine. Um, so if they're successful, then that's on them. If they're not successful, that's on them too. Uh, all I've been uh, is there to, to steer them early on in their lives and, you know, being a rugby coach here away a lot. Um, I've been, we're a blended family, so I've been married a couple of times and um, we're a blended family of six. So the person who probably needs to take most of the kudos is my wife, Tash. Um, she's worked hard at bringing us all together and, um, you know, we, we, we went to counselling very early on in our relationship, um, not because we needed to, but because of the circumstances, we had a dad living with us, we were a blended family of six. Um, clearly, having had been married twice before, I wasn't very good at it. So, you know, I said, look, let's go and have a crack at some counselling and see if I can get better. And, and let's see, if, you know, if you, how, how you're going to cope with having dad live with us and all those sorts of things. So, um, well, I thought it was the greatest thing we ever did because it set, uh, gave us a foundation to be able to to launch off and look again not saying we're perfect because nothing is but um you know it's a pretty good uh, situation we've got and um but yeah I, I don't think it's about parents saying you know i've created this the kids create themselves you just give them the opportunity to um through uh, you know their experiences with you and some of those will be bad ones and if they learn off the bad ones then that's good isn't it because then they don't have to make their own mistakes because you already made them for them and I've seen well okay I don't want to do that mm. yeah yeah and I mean I, I come from a Brady Bunch type family as well Steve and, and good on you for getting the counselling because it was something that I got access to a few years ago for my own demons and it, it changed my life really but I think there's yeah. a great quote like uh, don't, don't feel like you can't ask for help so that you may appear weak, ask for help so that you can remain strong. And, yeah. and I think, you know, growing up in that, in that blokey environment that we did, you know, and it would have been exacerbated from, I think you're about 20 years my senior. It would have been even more exacerbated back then. You know, there was a real culture, certainly in my own experience of uh, re repressing a lot of these things and not feeling comfortable sharing, you know, your, your, your demons and your emotions. And that's starting to really flip around now. And I'm, it's great to see someone like you be so open about that. And, I, and I'm really grateful that you're able to share that with us because I think it's really, really powerful. Yeah, look, I think it's just, you know, if you can be vulnerable, then uh, you get to talk about something that, that either is eating away at you or, or something that was eating away at you. And it, it lets people see the innermost, side of you and uh you know i 
I think if you're going to be a decent leader, you have to be vulnerable because it creates trust. It allows the people underneath you to be vulnerable as well. And um, yeah, it's just this way things are with us. That's how we do it. And sometimes we don't like uh, what we hear, but sometimes we have to hear it. I've got a curly one for you, Steve. Ian Roberts was the first openly gay rugby league player back in the 2000s. I think it might have been. How long before we see our very first openly gay All Black in the men's team? Oh, look, I'm sure there's been gay All Blacks. Um, but, yeah, that, that, that's their choice. If they, it's, not, it's not for rugby to say, or anybody else for that matter, to say, look, you know, tell us you're gay. If, they're not, if they don't feel uh, that way inclined, then why should they? It's their business. Um, and invariably, you know, we, we're judgmental of people and just, just worry about yourself, you know, like there's nothing wrong with, with uh, being gay and there's nothing wrong with being straight, you know, they're just, they're just people. And, um, you know, I, I was involved with Wales um, during the period when um, Alfie Thomas came out and, and um, told the world that he was gay. And yeah, you know, he, he had been married and, um, and he still has a marvelous or wonderful, wonderful relationship with his ex-wife. Um, he's now married uh, to, a, to a, you know, his male partner and, and living a happy life. And, but it was, it, you know, it's their choice to tell you, it's their business, it's not anyone else's. So uh, one day someone probably will. Um, and if they do, good on them. Um, but if, the, if you know, I'm, I would say we've already had uh, gay All Blacks. Um, but, you know, it's not the fact that they're gay that they're All Blacks, is it? I think <laughs> it's good enough to be All Blacks. You know, that's what we celebrate. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating one. It's not, you know, I, I couldn't care less what you do, in all honesty. Um, you know, what you do at home. Uh, it doesn't doesn't phase me at all. I'm curious to know with uh, what's his name, Iffy, the uh, the Welsh fella. Have you mm. kept in contact with him much? And and since he was uh, since he came out, has you know like Alan, the the comedian, when she came out, her she went through a lot of years of, of hell that she spoke about, and then it sort of swung around, and then people embraced her again, and she took off. Did anything similar happen to him after that? Um, well, Alfie came out in 2004 and I just uh, left um, and uh, we came back actually with the All Blacks in November. So I left in, I think it was in May and uh, sometime between that period and November he came out. So he asked me to come and see him. He came and told me and I just gave him a hug and I said, well, I don't care, Alfie, you know, you're still Alfie. And... Um, you know, we've had that relation ever since. So from my understanding, um, the Welsh boys all got around him because they loved him too. He's a real character and uh, he was a leader within the team. And um, yeah, they, were, they, they didn't care. And I think that, look, I, I don't know if he, he got um, crap from any of the fans or anything. He probably did from some people because there's people like that that can't help themselves. But um, no, he never talked about it too much. But do I keep in contact with him? Yeah, I um, not as much as as I I'd, I'd like with uh, you know same with a lot of my friends because just don't have time. He's on the other side of the world, but we speak from time to time, and it's always good. You just kick it off from where it left off, and um, yeah. Steve, have you have you copped flack over your career that has affected you at, at times more than other? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, early on in uh, the All Blacks uh, reign, um, we, we got away to a reasonably good start, and then we had a wee period in two thousand, excuse me, two thousand nine, when you know, we couldn't win a line out. And I was actually in charge of the line out, so <laughs> I was got a lot of flack, and and uh, you know, um, it probably drove me not to trust the media as much as uh, I, I possibly could have, or not not so much trust them, but have faith in them to be able to um, be honest. 
And uh, yeah, there were certain things that I could tell them and there were certain things I couldn't tell them. And um, I went to an interview uh, prior to we played Australia and we'd lost to South Africa three games in a row. And um, at the time they had two great line out forwards and Bucky's both there and um, Matfield was a, he, he was the, probably the best line out forward in, um, in the world at the time. And, they they tidied us up and anyway we played Australia and at the time our selection too we had we had you know we had two locks and and our loose forwards were tremendously good loose forwards but they weren't great line out forwards and uh, it was pretty easy to pick us off so we had to change what we were doing and when you make change you always go down before you come back up and you know before the Australian game we had one guy well, I was sort of at the point where you know I was. I was ready to have a bit of a go at the media, and and uh, which was naive, but anyway. Uh, one of them said to me, um, you know, have you thought about bringing this person in and bring and we'd we'd brought these people in, and I said, look, we've we've brought those people in, and and um, you know, we've got some good stuff out of them, but the players didn't want them back in, and so there was, and I couldn't say that. So I didn't, and, and then they said, oh, well, do you, you know, do you think you should bring them in? And I said, look, we're happy to be working away with what we're doing, and you know, we know that we'll get there when we get there. And this guy goes, oh, can you look yourself in the mirror? And I said, yeah, I, I, I look myself in the mirror every day, have a shave, but what about yourself? And he had a beard, you see. So we shut him down, and um, Jack Gibson was the guy that I used to... Um, enjoy reading about the league coach and he, he he had a saying that you never you know critics would never they never make a statue of a critic so i thought well, well today's the day i'll chuck that line and say you know because someone said well what about you think about all the critics and i said look i hear them but like they don't make statues out of critics <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the next guy um, he turned around and said to me, he said, oh, do you think they'll ever make a statue of you? I said, no, they probably won't, but they will definitely won't be making one of you either. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I sort of terminated the, the conversation and left. And and um, for the want of a better term, I got the shits with them. And, and you know, we won all our lineups this two days later. And I wouldn't go to the after, I wouldn't go to the 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 uh, press conference afterwards, I said, no, nah, they can get stuffed and I'm not going. I said to Graham, I said, no, I'm not going. I'm just out of protest. And anyway, um, I, I, I sat on it and it wasn't, like, it wasn't the right thing to do. I, I feuded on it for quite some time and eventually I let the, the bubble burst. And this is why you've got to, you've got to speak about the things that are troubling you. And it happened in Marseille. The guy that asked me about the statue, he, he, Jim Case was his name, and we've become good friends, actually, which was good. He said something to me on the sideline, and that was, that was the last straw that broke the camel's back, and I absolutely let him have it. <laughs> and um, anyway, I walked off, you know, feeling pretty good about myself, and, and then Richie came over to me, actually, and said, you know, how, how do you think that went? I said, it went pretty good, I think. He said, he knows exactly how I feel about him, and he said, yeah, how do you think it went for the team going forward? And I just stopped and, you know, not too good, I suppose. I'd better go and have a cup of coffee with him. So uh, I did that, um, you know, a couple of months later and I went and got some help, um, media stuff with a guy called Ian Fraser, who's a uh, top bloke, and, you know, sat down and got a better understanding and a bit of a strategy for everything. And, um, yeah, life became a little easier. And then I became the head coach and... I think it's easier when you're the head coach, you can take it where you want to take it rather than support the person who's taken it in one direction. So, um, yeah, and the rest is history, really. So the two guys I had the, the bust up with became people that uh, I enjoyed their company. So, That's a great result. And, and yeah. Steve, how's, how are you giving back these days? Are you involved with any philanthropic style events or... What's happening in your life in that area? Uh, in in the rugby area. Oh, just with involved. Uh, I know uh, John Kerwin's involved with a lot of mental health 
Um, Mike King, the comedian's coming on the show. Uh, he's, you know, a huge advocate for mental health. Is there anything that you're aligned with that you'd, you want to share with us today? Um, not really. I'm, I'm sort of on the wings. Like I've helped Mike King do some stuff and, um, you know, I've, I've not really assigned myself to anything really. There's a, there's a group that, are, um, that I, I, I won't mention because I don't want to feel like I'm saying I'm a big part of it, but uh, they're launching a program on Friday um, that, and I've played a really, really small part in helping them come together. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, the people that are driving that are good people, so uh, they'll do a great job and uh, they're, they're launching it national nationally. Um, but I think my role as, as uh, when I was the All Black coach was to be consistent with the messaging uh, around it and to be vulnerable enough to, to make people feel it was safe enough for them to be vulnerable and that was the best way I was going to be able to help them and that's what we tried to do um, both as, as a coach and, and the players as well you know they sort of um, you know we, we had a great example uh, at, at the World Cup when we got beaten by England um, to show some of vulnerability and some honesty and, and you know uh, the fact that we lost here, it hurt like hell and um, did it affect us here? Um, but we talked about it and we were strong enough to talk about it as a group and that allowed us to regroup and um, overcome it. Wow. Steve, I'm going to wrap this up. I know you're, even though you're locked down at home, you've got plenty going on and we're super grateful that you're able to come and share this, this uh, really amazing stuff with us today. Do you have anything that you'd like to finish on to share with us all? Yeah, look, I think the big thing, you know, we're talking about being vulnerable. It, 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 the big thing is to be brave enough to actually say how you feel, you know, and, and, and if you can, when you do, um, you'll find that other people are feeling the same thing. You know, what you're feeling a lot of the time is just normal. But because you're not talking about it and, and don't feel safe enough to talk about it because you're frightened that people are going to laugh at you or ridicule you, um, it becomes bigger than it is. And uh, you know, everybody is loved by somebody. And, and, you know, when we lose somebody, it's just, it's just tragic, you know, particularly when it's not necessary. And, you know, I've had friends that have um, committed suicide and, and, you know, it's tragic when you hear that they thought no one liked them. Because usually, invariably, they were the person everybody liked. Um, and so, you know, if you, if you feel like you're feeling that way, then be brave enough to talk to somebody. And if you're the lucky person they talk to, then be kind enough to hear it. And, and just love them. You know, you don't have to find the solution for them, but what they want is just to be loved and reassured that it's okay. So, you know, for me, that would be my message. You know, be brave and, and be kind. That's really great, Steve. And if I was there, I'd give you a big man hug and just wanted to say a huge big thank you today. Ladies and gentlemen, Sir Steve Hansen. And yeah, just, just stick with us, Steve, will be good. Ha, ha, ha.